In today's video, what we're gonna be doing is a very quick recap on the 2022-2023 breeding season. I'll show you guys some of the pairs that I have set up. I'll show you some of the chicks that we've been hatching so far. And I'll go into a little bit more details as to how it is that I set up these birds in order to be successful during the breeding season. This is a common question that I get all the time here on the channel asking me, how do you set up the birds? What size cages do you put them in? What nest box do you use? What do you do to get them into breeding condition? And this is something that is very crucial if you want to be successful during your breeding season. So hopefully by the end of today's video, you'll have a better idea of how it all works out so that you can have a successful season as well. All right, so let's get straight into it. If you wanna set up your birds, it's not difficult. Now today what we're gonna to concentrate is on how to set up the Australian species. These are gonna be the easiest ones to set up and breed. We're not gonna go into details as far as how to set up the Africans, which are a little bit more complicated and have more requirements. But as far as the Australians, now when I say Australians, I am referring to the Gouldians, the star finches, the owl finches, the mass grass finches, and so on. So once you get these birds, it is very important to put them in the right environment. For breeding cages, as you can see back here, the majority of all my cages are 24 by 16. Those are the perfect size cages for these Australian species because they like it. The Australian species tend to be a bit more domesticated than the Africans. Remember that all these Australian species that we have here in the US are cage bred. These birds come from Europe. They supply us with all these birds and for years and years they have been cage bred so they're used to cages. Now once I put them in these cages, I go ahead and I place the nest. The nest that I use is a nest box that I hang on the outside of the cage. And one of the reasons why I put these nests on the outside of the cage is because I don't like to put anything on the inside of the cage and have to stick my hand in there to do nest inspections. The last thing that you want is to stress these birds out during the breeding season. So the less that you open these cages to go inside and stick your hands inside, the better it's going to be for them and the more successful that pair will be. So one of the things that I have to do, which I hate doing, is I have to butcher the cages. I have to unfortunately cut little slots on the wire to make sure that I open a hole where they can go in and out of that nest if I want to hang it on the outside. But this gives me the ability to do nest inspections without bothering the pairs. And in return, that avoids having them, for example, toss chicks or abandon nests. Because all you do is from the outside, you lift off that lid just a little bit, have a quick peek, and you're done. The pairs do not care too much when you do this. They don't abandon, they don't toss, at least with my experience that I've had here. So it's a very good way of you being able to do nest inspections. Now, in order to bring these birds into breeding condition, you're gonna need quite a few things. You are gonna need the right amount of light hours, you're gonna need good nutrition, and you're gonna need to be patient. And usually patience is the one that gets the most people because some of these birds, they come into condition at different times. You may have a pair that comes into condition very quickly without even having the right hours or the right nutrition, while others, you give them everything they need and it almost seems like they take forever or they don't wanna come into conditions. And there are many factors that could tell you why this is happening, like the age of the bird and so on. But let's focus on light hours right now. Let's start at the beginning. For light hours here at the aviary, my lights turn on at six in the morning and they shut off at eight o'clock at night. So as you can see, they have a very big window of about 14 hours of daylight. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 14. And usually this is something that I start to increment at the beginning of the breeding season. I'll give you guys the example. I breed usually from around October to April. April I stop, I let the birds rest, separate everybody, and then around August or September, I start to repair again. So as soon as I stop breeding in April, or before I finish breeding in April, I start to diminish my light hours. So let's say right now I'm at 14 hours. Usually around February, I'll start to decrease the light hours. And what this is gonna do is that slowly it starts to get these birds out of breeding condition. They start to see that the days are getting shorter and shorter and the hens will stop laying, they'll slow down with their breeding progress, they'll go out of that breeding condition that they're in and they'll slowly start to molt little by little. Now, once I see that the birds are starting to molt, I start to separate the pairs all the way up to when we get to April. By the time we get to April, usually during that time, we're at about 10 hours a day. 
sometimes even less. Nine to 10 hours a day usually is what I give them of light. By then, most of the birds are already going through their molt. They get that rest period all the way up to about August. In August, I start to increment the light hours again, little by little, getting them to go up. They start going up from 9 to 10, 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 12 to 13, and so on until we get to 14 hours of daylight a day. And usually, by the time that we hit 14 hours of daylight, we are in October. The birds already have their nest and they are ready to go. So as you can see, light hours play a very crucial part in your bird's behavior as far as how they get into condition, when they start their molt, and so on. So it is a visual clue that these birds need in order to properly breed. So make sure that you are offering the right light hours. The second thing that you're gonna focus on is your nutrition. When the birds are in the breeding season, one of the things that you want to make sure that you do is that you offer them the correct nutrition, and that is not just seeds. They need much more than just seeds in order to get into proper breeding conditions. There are a couple different methods that I use here in the bird room to get these guys into breeding condition. One of them, very simple, and my favorite is sprouted seeds. Sprouted seeds are a great method of getting your birds into the proper breeding condition because they are very nutritious. They are very high in protein. Now, one of the things that I see that many people do is they make the mistake of letting the seeds sprout a bit too much. By the time that they offer the seed to the bird, it has a very long stem already, and by then, the seed has already used its nutrition in order to grow that stem. You have to make sure that when you sprout your seeds, you give it to the birds right after they chit. The, the little stem, as soon as it pops out, it's just, you're gonna notice a tiny little break through the seed. That's when you want to offer it to the birds. That is when that seed itself is at its highest nutritional point. If you wait too long, the seed uses that nutrition or that protein to help itself grow. So if it helps itself grow and it uses that protein by the time you offer it to the birds, it's not nutritious anymore. It's pretty much the same as a normal seed. So make sure that you offer it during the right time. What I do is I sprout my seeds and I give it to the birds on a daily basis in the morning. And this is for the breeding pairs. I give them about, I want to say per cage where there's two birds or a pair of birds. I give them about a full teaspoon of sprouted seeds. And this is enough to get that initial spark. This is how I start to get them into breeding condition with something that's simple like sprouted seeds. Now, after I've been doing this for about three weeks, I go ahead and I start to incorporate a little bit of egg food. And you have to be very careful with your egg food. One of the reasons I say this is because there are species of birds, like for example, the parrot finches and the gouldians, which can at times be gluttons. If you feed too much egg food, your bird will become obese. When that bird becomes obese, it loses the ability to be successful at copulating or mating. And in return, you're gonna get eggs that are infertile. And that is a huge problem. You want to avoid that at all costs, especially with the Gouldians, for example. Most times when you pair Gouldians, the first clutch, especially if they're first timers, their first, second clutch could be infertile. So the last thing you want is to also have a bird that is obese and have them continuously giving you unfertile eggs every single time. So let's say by the third week, I start to incorporate a little bit of egg food with the sprouted seeds. Now what this does is it kind of moistens that egg food. And when I say egg food, I'm talking about the commercial style egg food. Um, any commercial style egg food that's out on the market, you can use, you mix it with your sprouted seeds and it kind of moistens it up. So now it's not as dry as it would be if you just offer the commercial egg food alone. And the birds love this. One of the things that I've noticed over the years is that you have to offer the egg food a bit moist. If it's not moist, they're not gonna take to it the same way that they would if it was moistened up. So by the third week, I start to incorporate the egg food. This is gonna be great for them. They're gonna get something a little bit different. Now, when I incorporate it with the egg food, I make sure that there is more sprouted seeds than egg food in the mix. And then I do this for another week. By the end of that fourth week, you're gonna notice that your birds are a little bit more accelerated. They are starting to come into that breeding condition. The males are singing more. The females, you may start to notice some changes in them. If they're Gouldians, for example, you may notice that the female's beak is a little bit darker in color. You may notice the female fluttering her wings. She may be checking out or showing more interest in the nest that you have in the cage. This is the perfect time 
to start adding your nesting material. Once you put your nesting material in the cage, they should take to it very quickly and they should start to build that nest between the male and the female. If you don't see that there's any progress, if you don't see that they're not interested in the nesting material, then continue giving them the egg food and the sprouted seeds until they come into breeding condition. Now, with the egg food, you want to be careful. Like I said, you don't want to offer too much. You don't want to offer too little. So usually when I mix the egg food and the sprouted seeds, I do the same thing, about half of a teaspoon to a teaspoon per cage per pair of birds, and it seems to do the trick just fine. So that's pretty much it as far as how to set up your birds, how to put them in their cages, adding the nest, the light hours, the nutrition. As you can see, it's something that's not difficult. It's pretty simple. It's pretty basic. You just have to be patient. All of this takes time and some birds, some species, some pairs may take more time than others to come into breeding condition. Heck, it's December right now. We just started December 1st and I have pairs back here on this wall, which are all the breeders that have still not laid one egg. And it's because they are young pairs. It's the first time getting ready for this season. Maybe they're not ready yet maybe they haven't come into condition and i've been doing everything possible to get them ready but sometimes you just have to be patient and let the birds do what they do so if i notice that they don't do anything this year separate them maybe they were too young now normally personally i wait till the females are one year old but i've had some females that don't want to breed when they're one maybe they want to breed when they're a year and a half and some of them do their best when they're two years old so just be patient with your pairs if they don't want to breed separate them, put a new pair in that cage and start the process over again. Now, as far as the breeding season so far, it's been great. We are about halfway through the breeding season and this is usually about the time of the year when the birds take a small recess. It's almost like a lunch break during the breeding season. So usually we start in October and the breeding season starts off great, full blast. Then by the time that we get to December, the birds take almost like a small little break in between where they slow down and then January comes around again and boom, it's like a roller coaster going straight up again all the way up till we get to April, which is by that time we're completely done. So the nests back here are pretty much all full. Um, been hatching a lot of different species of chicks. As you can imagine, way more Australians than African species. The Africans are all outdoors. I'm pretty much letting them do their own thing, breeding when they want to and doing what they want to out there in that large outdoor aviary. In here, pretty much what I have are just the Dybolski twin spots, a couple of strawberries, and that's it. But pretty much everything in here is just Australian species. Gouldians, star finches, owl finches, mass grass finches. We also have the parrot finches, the red throats, the blue face, uh, the forbs, and so on. So a lot of different species in here that have been doing great. What I have noticed is that although this year is a whole lot better than last year because last year was a horrible year when it came to breeding, not just for me, but for a lot of different breeders all across the world. Um, it is a better year, but I have noticed that the nests are not complete nests. What do I mean by that? Well, usually I'm used to having nests that have five eggs, four hatch, five eggs, three hatch, five eggs, five hatch, and so on. You always have a couple here and there that don't hatch. It's normal. The chick can either get stuck inside of the egg, the chick dies prior to uh, actually making it out of the egg, and so on. There's always chances of things like this happening. It's normal. But what I have noticed this year, although the production is up, there are a lot more birds laying eggs, there are a lot more chicks hatching, the nests don't seem quite full. There are nests, or the majority of the nests in here occupy two to three chicks, max. Very rarely have I had a nest that has had four chicks. So I'm not quite sure why that's happening. I do have a lot of pairs that are new this year also. They're first time breeders. So it's normal for fertility to be a bit down. So hopefully as they get more experience, maybe in the second half of the breeding season, they'll start to have a bit more fertile eggs. But only time will tell what's going to happen. All right, guys, that's going to be the end for today's video. I really hope that you have enjoyed this short tutorial on how to set up your pairs and the quick update on some of the things that have been going on here in the bird room and some of the species that we have been hatching. Comment below. Let me know how your breeding season has gone so far and let me know what you're working with. Like always, if you've enjoyed the video, remember to hit a thumbs up, like and subscribe, and we will see each other in the next one. Bye.